we are delighted, as usual, um, to have uh, one of our regular contributors back with us um, from his uh, from many travelling experiences. I imagine he's had over the past while. Back with us, uh, Peter Wadhams. Hi, Peter. Hi. Hello, Peter. Welcome to Extinction Radio. So good to have you here. Yes, yeah, nice to see you again. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I take it you've been traveling uh, a lot, Peter, and uh, you've been checking out, um, tell me if I'm wrong, you've been checking out carbon capture technology. It's been your goal, is that correct? Yes, I've been looking at that. Um, I, I, I got back, I'd, I'd spent several months in, uh, in Scripps Institute of Oceanography la last year, and then I came back beginning of this year. I've, so I've been traveling, th first of all, to Japan, and uh, discussing uh, new technology with them, and then uh, to Italy, where I'm, I'm doing some teaching. So in, in each case, uh, there's a. I'm also trying to to make sure my book gets properly uh, uh, sold, or because there's a an, a Japanese edition has just come out, no. of, and uh, and also an Italian edition and. Yes. The Italian edition is called Adio ai Ghiacci, uh, translated by my wife. Uh, so I've been promoting the Italian edition at the Milan Book Fair and the Japanese edition at a conference in Japan. So the only edition that's not been promoted very well is the British one, where they, they've, they've just told me that they're kind of abandoning it and, and, uh, 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 because I wanted to write a follow-on related to um, uh, geoengineering and carbon capture. How are we going to do that? How we, we can kind of save the world that way. But uh, Penguin Books doesn't seem to be much interested in that. So I'm going to have to now search for a new publisher. Mm. Oh, and, and for those of you who don't know, we're talking about Peter Wadham's latest book, and this is Farewell to Ice, and it's a remarkable book, and it journals his um, journeys throughout the Arctic, his observations, and his kind of philosophy about life in this time that we're living. Yeah, and, and since we're on this subject, we, we, let's get into the, 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 meat, the meat of it. I mean, Farewell to Ice is, is a brilliant book. Um, as Jen, um, Jen says. Um, but we've asked for a few questions, uh, Peter, from uh, the people in our support group. And we're just going to bash on, uh, since we're talking about carbon capture, with this one from Jen, uh, Jen Bendel. And he says that your uh, WAPO, does that mean anything to you, your WAPO article? Washington Post. Washington Post. Oh, that's okay, yes. I don't yes. know what WAPO meant myself, maybe it's Japanese or something, you know. But your Washington Post article called for massive sequestration efforts, yet your data in uh, the Washington Post implied we need to upscale current CO2 rem removal capabilities by two million times in two years. Um, how's it going? Well, it's not going well. Obviously, I, I, did, I don't think I said two years, but I said we must do this as quickly as we can. Yeah. Um, in the book, really, I, I say, well, we don't, we don't really have the capability of reducing carbon emissions fast enough to save ourselves from very large amounts of warming. Um, that we have the capability, but we, there isn't the will anywhere in the world. And I, I can see it's not just the US withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, it's every other nation in the world will stay in the Paris Agreement, but, but mysteriously will come up with less than they claim in terms of savings of CO2. So that the, the sum total of global savings of CO2 won't be enough to prevent um, warming well ex exceeding two degrees by quite a, a large but quite a large amount and two degrees is a, a number which isn't pulled out of thin air it it, it represents the the, uh, the maximum warming we can have without um, impacting very seriously on crop pr production so we go be beyond two degrees we're going to start starving um, so I'm saying I, I'm sort of saying well we we have to to get emissions down to the point where the warming doesn't exceed two degrees but we're not going to there isn't the will and and um, the, it, it will be very difficult it won't happen 
therefore the only solution is is to to put all our efforts into finding a way to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere directly direct air capture and this this can be done and there are methods that that work there's there's various pilot plants uh, that already started up and one recently in in iceland and another one in the us so we can do it but we have to make sure that first of all we we do enough research to bring the price down and then having brought the price down we still have to persuade the world to to pay for it because this is something where in order to to remove enough carbon from the atmosphere to to, to save ourselves from global warming we have to pay for uh, enough plants that to, to to do the job at forty dollars a ton and that's that is very expensive but it has to be done it's like saying how would you like to to pay out a large amount of money or how would you like to be dead and the trouble is the british well not the british the global population seems to be so um supine about this that they uh, you sort of feel they wouldn't mind being dead as long as it doesn't cost them too much and that that's a pretty grim prospect which has to be fought against yeah and it's a pretty formidable foe isn't it um the economy i suppose you know and the economic growth is a pretty formidable foe and so is the, the political institutions and you know i, I remember you, you said to me that it's gonna take 10 years to scale up um you know so you know um i take it you're not feeling that confident then Peter, that um this is going to happen well i was more confident before trump um right but with with trump we're dealing with such a negative force such a disastrous ludicrous sick person uh in in such a powerful position that that it's it could well screw up the entire global effort to 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 actually try and get us out of this situation it's it's a, a matter of vision you know in this time of extreme catastrophe and, and pending doom really i mean what is called for is not like some kind of strong man but we need wisdom we need vision we need understanding and i don't see that happening in the political arena at all um, almost in, in, in any wow. country. Um, I have a question. I mean, now that we're talking about the planet warming and things like that, let's, let's kind of turn our minds to the Arctic, um, your specialty, if you don't mind. So let's talk about an ice-free Arctic. And a couple of questions here. So how much um, would the planet warm once we lose the ice in the Arctic? Because the Arctic I sea ice is keeping mm. the planet the top of the planet rather cool and and then you know when this warms what effect is this going to have on the jet stream in an ice free arctic could you dive into that please yes well well the, the warming is going to accelerate and it already is accelerating um because as as the sea ice area retreats the you you get an albedo feedback that the open extra open water absorbs more radiation and the warming accelerates so the, the warming is already accelerating we're, we're already on a kind of exponential path upwards so i don't think there's there's a critical point at which suddenly the warming will speed up it's already speeding up um and uh the the effects on that are the, the sort of ones that i really already talked about and uh, are acceleration always it's an exponential growth that's sadly like acceleration of of uh sea global sea level rise is happening but as as the temperature warms up exponentially the the rate of melt of the uh, greenland and antarctic ice sheets increases and we we get an exponential growth in in um, sea level rise and and the trouble with exponentials is that that when you're standing on an expert some somebody said you're standing on an exponential curve you look behind you and it's all flat and it doesn't nothing looks too bad we're only slightly we're only slightly rising in sea level we're only slightly warming you look ahead of you and you're going right up a steep slope and everything is is going crazy so if you're on an exponential 
there's a the temptation always is to be complacent that that you know i haven't i haven't died yet i haven't blown up yet every um everything in the past was kind of changing slowly so why shouldn't things continue to change slowly in the future and that that's the big fallacy that that people uh, unfortunately fall for and and don't therefore don't don't take any action yeah um, um while we're on the arctic um i, I found, it, found it interesting that you said that the two degrees i mean crops are already failing you know i don't know what what degrees we're at now i mean um you get lots of different um, scientists saying different things. You get, you know, some say we're at one degree, some say we're at 1.5 degrees. What kind of temperature do you think we're at uh, here at the moment, uh, above pre-industrial times? Oh, well, we're, we're above one. We're about 1.2, something like that. But the, the, two, the two degrees actually um, is, is, is two degrees above pre-industrial, so that's less than a degree to go. And when you look at the, the crop yields of nearly every major crop, they, they peak. They actually, they haven't quite peaked yet because um, up to a point, the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in, improves growth. So uh, up to about one, one and a half degrees, about more or less where we are now, you get a peak of, of, of crop productivity, but it starts to go down very fast after that. And at two degrees, it's down. And three degrees, it's something like 20% down for most crops. And then it goes down to 30, 40%. You're, you're losing the, the production of major crops. This is rice, uh, wheat, uh, corn. Ev every, every major food crop in the world is dim starts to diminish be beyond two degrees and, and diminishes pretty fast thereafter. You know, we, we were, we're, we're going to be if we're up to four degrees by the end of the century, which we could easily be, then that, that will be a, a, a pretty massive decrease in, in crop production. Um, so that's just at a time when, when the population is growing very fast. So there'll be a collision between population and food production, which will be pretty disastrous. Mm, doesn't sound like you have a lot of hope for us right now. Um, it's a very scary thing. Um, I'd like to talk about methane. Um, lately, there have been lots of methane emissions being seen in the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. Um, mm -hmm. In the beginning of March, there were some pretty heavy methane emissions that pushed it well above 3,000 parts per billion. So I was wondering if you could talk about methane, what you see about mm -hmm. abrupt methane emissions, and what you see about the consequences of these abrupt methane emissions on humanity and the overall temperature and famine and things like that, please. Well, um, we're trying to, uh, we're at the moment, have a big proposal in with the European Union to go and spend a lot of time up in the East Siberian Sea with, uh, uh, there's a, a couple of Russian ships that, uh, that, that are going to be used. Um, and if we can get that funding, then we'll be able to actually measure the methane levels in, in the uh, plumes that are coming out of the East Siberian Sea and at the simultaneously look down at the sources, uh, see see where what what the sort of fractures are in the seabed that produce the methane, and get a much better feel for for what the total uh, methane is going to be. Whether there will be uh, a major outbreak rather than simply a, at the moment there seems to be a con like everything else in the world exponential increase in the emissions of methane per year, but what the Russians fear is not not just an exponential increase, but a kind of a a, a sudden jump, which will be the uh, all all of the bot uh, seabed um, permafrost melting at the same time and suddenly. Is that is that, is that the fifty gigaton burp we're hearing about? Yeah, yeah that's the fifty gig, gigaton one, and it, if that happens, that's gives you immediately 0.6 of a degree warming of, of the whole planet. That's, um, and uh, well, you know, 0.6 of a degree doesn't sound a lot, but in fact, to happen immediately is something that would just be disastrous or, or you can't really in, even imagine what it would be like. 
So um, we, we have to hope that won't happen, but we don't know it won't happen until we can actually study that area properly. Is there a... No, go ahead. Um, tell, tell me something. I'll, I'll let you come in. Sorry, John. Um, tell me something, Pierre. Um, we're, we're talking about methane um, in the East, East Siberian uh, shelf there and, uh, you know, Alaska too, and in the Arctic, all those regions. But um, there's an article recently about um, methane in Mexico, um, in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, how far spread is methane around the world? I mean, is this in every ocean? Or is it everywhere? You know, I'm a bit confused about this. Well, yes, it's in a lot of the oceans, and there's a lot of methane uh, being emitted from the seabed. But um, in most of the oceans, it, it's not important because the methane redissolves before it reaches the surface. It dissolves back into the into the water, and it doesn't actually get released to the atmosphere. So the really yeah. dangerous regions are where the water depth is very shallow and that the East Siberian Sea and, and all the, the Russian Arctic seas are 50 to 100 metres water depth, and that just means nearly all the methane just comes straight out into the atmosphere, whereas um, deep, deep waters, um, the methane comes out but then redissolves so it doesn't get, get the atmosphere. And, and, and what, if there, what if there is, I mean, you're, you must be talking some great depths here, but what if there are like, you know, these, uh, the pingo things that we see, um, we see on, on the land in Siberia, for mm. instance, and there are things like that under, under the sea as well, at the mm. bottom of the mm. sea. Um, is, is there any likelihood that, you know, even in places like Mexico, there could be so much pressure that, that it could actually blow out into the atmosphere? Um, yes, well, the, these, um, these great big holes in Siberia look like they were the results of, of explosions un, of methane under pressure. And it's not clear when they all happened, but but it, it might not have been very long ago um, it, it, because nobody was there to see. Um, so it, it, this is not necessarily ancient methane explosions. They could have been something that happened just a few years ago. Yeah, and, and Jennifer, didn't you have a, do you have a question about civilization? Um, but she could maybe fit into this. It's, I believe from Nicholas Humphrey. I don't know if you know Nicholas Humphrey. Uh, Nicholas Humphrey is a very talented meteorologist that we have in the near term human extinction support group. And um, he does want to understand, you know, um, how hot can it get and when will human civilization fail due to heat and to famine? These aren't very happy mm. questions. And I think also. I would like to bring in to consideration the nuclear plant question um, as well, because that's going to come in with sea level rise. So could you talk about what's, what's the most dangerous? Is it the immediate heat, the sea level rise, or like the nuclear plants melting down from, you know, getting inundated? Uh, well, of <laughs> course, they're all pretty dangerous. Uh, is question of what's, what's the most immediately dangerous? I mean, my, I said, my feeling is we need to be sure that um, we're not going to get a methane outbreak. That, that's, if, that, if we can show that, we, if we can be safely sure that methane is only going to come out at some steadily increasing rate, then, then we don't have to worry, well, we do have to worry about it, but it's not going to be so bad. The, 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 the next thing after that, I think, is, is the, 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 the warming, the effect of warming on on crop production exacerbated by the fact that we're now getting these weather events uh, just like we've had in in Britain and Europe in the past last month um, that you a, a weather event gives you absolutely unseasonable um, either heat or cold um, and it's because of this um, slowing down of the jet stream producing these lobes and but if that gets to be a habit which it seems to have done in the last eight or nine years then that that in itself will also um, impact um, food production because it's affecting mid-latitudes so the the uh, it's, it's not just that there's an overall warming um, that's reducing crop yields there's these extreme events which themselves are causing kind of catastrophic impacts on on crops in mid northern latitudes so we've got an extra thing coming up there on 
on disruption of food production at a time when when there's there's been no restrictions on on um, human population and it's growing like crazy uh, everybody is ignoring that which is kind of weird because in in the in 1972 remember the, the uh, uh, limits to growth book um the one of the main things they were worried about was was um population explosion and um the the, the feeling there was we'll exceed the, the the holding capacity of the planet if we keep on increasing population then suddenly people started to forget about that mm. and uh, uh, you, you, you're not almost, almost not even allowed to talk about it now. No, the lake sounds too much better. You know, that's the trouble. People like to like sex. You know, what, you know, <laughs> what happened to us? What happened to us there? How come we like sex? How come we don't have seasons? Like no, other no. things, you know. There are technical means of avoiding. <laughs> <laughs> There are means of avoiding it. Yeah, that, that is very true. There are means, but um, you've you've sorry, completely sorry. upset my my thought process. I had some very good questions to ask Professor Wadhams, and now I'm like all flummoxed. <laughs> um, okay, so here's here's the deal. Is here. It looks to me. Like I'm looking at, you know, the great works that have been written. In 1968, we had Paul Ehrlich, and he came out with the population bomb. Then in 1972, we had limits to growth. We've been looking at this problem for 50 years. I mean, look at it. 1968 was 50 years ago. We haven't made much progress in 50 years, and it's almost like there's a cognitive dissonance that's setting into humanity at large and it's like we can kind of hold one thought and by the time we hold that thought and understand it then we're looking at this and we forget about this and why is it that we can't look at everything at the same time we need to get to a higher point of consciousness where we can deal with these things even at a cognitive level in order to synthesize all this information to understand the catastrophe that's impending what do you think about that well yes i wish we could i mean uh limits to growth the, the reason why it got sidelined and ignored was because the, the disasters that they forecast didn't happen fast enough they they the, because we developed things like uh, um, uh, better crops the green revolution in crops it, it sort of it didn't it didn't it, it didn't uh, save us from the the kind of the, the sort of all in, all embracing catas catastrophe that was forecast it just postponed it so the fact that it hadn't happened meant the human the human race likes if nothing disastrous has happened the human race likes to kind of go to sleep and so limits to growth was kind of poo-pooed because it didn't there wasn't any any immediate impact as they had foreseen but now um Lewis growth was the first really case of global dynamics where instead of just looking at individual processes you try to look at how they all interact uh, and and what through through modeling that that every possible uh, energy process in in the planet and come up with what what will what will happen um that was actually a very valid approach the first time that had been done and and it uh, since then there's been a kind of brave group of people who've carried on limits to growth and produced kind of limits to growth two and three and the, today the, there's it, it has is coming back into its own because we know that we have to to do a kind of global dynamics approach to, to, we have to look at every process that's happening as integrated with every other process and not not sitting by itself um so we uh that that's coming back in and the of course the the catastrophes that they forecast have only been postponed not not stopped so we're we're coming into experiencing them now um so it, it again it, it's it's always that that we now have the ability to be able to forecast what's going to happen if we don't do anything but we're still not doing anything so um that's pretty <laughs> dispiriting <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Jen, Jen talked about a, a cognitive dissonance and maybe a, a kind of, um, a, <clears throat> you know, some kind of 
I, I, I know yourself, Peter. I think you, you believe in reincarnation, right? Am I right? Um, well, I think it's a possibility, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a possibility, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of atheist, but when, when, when I get into bother, I, I do speak to, I do say some words like Lord and God and stuff like that, help me and things like that when I get into real bother. Um, but um, I, I really, for me, I, I really don't see, um, I don't see there being a, a, a kind of, I don't know if this is what you meant, Jennifer, but I don't see there being like some kind of consciousness level rise where we all get together and create carbon capture machines, you know? And it's a great back. hope, but you know what? Human beings are a very greedy race and we're selfish and we're very self-centered. So really the only way to make this happen is to appeal to our lower nature and make it so appealing that it's got to happen. You've got to make it into some sort of luscious business opportunity. You've got to be able to like mm. package all this carbon that you get you know into like lots of other lovely little devices that you can sell for lots of money the only way out is if we can appeal to our lower nature because we're just a pretty despicable race when it comes to you know what we're thinking and what we're doing and how selfish we are so you know I don't really think and I wasn't really talking about you know the other worlds or anything like that when I was talking about a transcendent consciousness what I was talking mm -hmm. about more was the hundredth monkey and I was really just talking about a consciousness revolution in awareness and it really has to do with critical mass on an idea being adopted you know idea adaptation happens when you get a critical mass of the mass consciousness you know and they've done experiments with this and this is not like woo woo stuff this is you know they've they so just look up hundredth monkey if you have any questions about that but I was just kind of wondering you know like um, when you know if this thing can seep into the popular culture you know before you can really do anything about something you have to really have an awareness about doing something and then you can go ahead and appeal to the lower nature and get it done but before you can get it done you have to have an awareness that you actually have a problem so you know what I was wondering is if we were going to get to a space where we would actually understand that we have a problem and not really just sort of you know push it under like a bunch of ostriches you know yeah but, but I think I think this is uh, this is why farewell to ice has to be sold and penguin shouldn't be pulling out you know of, of that um, um, but the, for me, there's all, always the issue as well when, when you inform people is that um, ignorance is bliss a lot of the time for me, Peter. Um, you probably wouldn't agree with that because you don't want everybody to read Farewell to Ice. But um, there's going to be, for me, there's going to be so many, so many catastrophes and we, we always find that we, we cannot uh, speak to people about this um, when we have the knowledge that we have. Um, I don't know if you find that, Peter, but um, within the extinction movement, if you like, us crazy cranks who believe that we're going to extinct a lot sooner than you do, um, but then I, we cannot speak to anybody about this. We, it's a very, you know, it's, it's not, yeah, you know, it can be called a cult, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's a very lonely place for us, Peter. It really is a very lonely place out with the support group where people can go to and speak to each other about it because they can't speak to their, their husbands or wives or children or anything about this. Um, <clears throat> so it really is a lonely place um, when you believe in near-term human extinction. Yes. Um, you know, yours is slightly, your time scale is, is, is kind of a, a little bigger than ours. Um, a, little, a little, you know, it, it's, um, you're talking sort of a hundred years potentially yeah. if that nothing happens um no. are you no no I'm, I'm thinking more about 20 to 30 years before we right get okay this is a big change for you peter i i you know over the years that we've been having you on extinction radio we've watched you go through an evolution and you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I have to confess i've been kind of watching you um progress in your assessments of things and uh, everything that you've presented today even though we've kind of said it in the same you know nice voices and everything like that I mean you know you look at it it's particularly dire and you know what you know just to summarize what you've said today you've said a population's going up 
B, it's getting hotter. C, methane emissions are increasing. We possibly might get flash fried, fried to the tune of, you know, half a degree almost fairly instantaneously, which is non-good. B, carbon sequestration is not really working because people are not doing it. And, mm. you know, D, the political situation is atrocious and, and everybody's, you know, completely caught in, in distraction. So I'm watching you and I'm seeing your own assessment changing year by mm. year. Is that, do you think I'm, I'm correct on that? No, I think you're right because, um, uh, I mean, it, it's certainly my assessment is changing because I think the evidence is showing that everything is accelerating much faster than, than one, one thought. And um, some of these, for instance, you've mentioned this question of uh, lowest levels of consciousness. And of course, if you look for the lowest levels of consciousness, you naturally think of Trump. And here you're dealing with a guy uh, who weirdly, bizarre, first of all, he knows perfectly well that global warming is happening and he's prepared to sacrifice the entire planet in order to, to, to keep his, his, his uh, voting base, which is pretty despicable. And, and, but then on top of that, the, the, the weirdly positive thing is that he's talked about um, geoengineering in a positive way. Now, he's supposedly he doesn't believe that global warming's happening, yet at the same time, he's, he wants to do geoengineering, which puts a kind of sticking plaster on global warming and would enable you, presumably, therefore, to keep on digging up coal and burning oil. So he, he wants to do glo geoengineering, not because it's a way of slowing down global warming so we can survive until we can actually get rid of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It, he wants to slow down global warming so that you can keep on using fossil fuels galore. Uh, and uh, so in a weird way, that might encourage something good being done, which is de de development and application of geoengineering methods. Um, so I suppose you can say good can come out of evil. It's very hard to imagine, but maybe it can. <laughs> well, 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 you know, I, sorry, Maya, I just got to say this. I, I've been thinking the same thing, and it's almost like he's a cathartic presence. He's so despicable, so evil, so like you have to react to him. I mean, if you have mm. a moral bone in your entire body, you just completely outraged about the whole thing. So maybe in a strange way, he might be giving rise to a level of awareness in just people's reactions. Maybe there's like energy being put into the reaction. I don't know. Do you think that's possible? Um, well, it, it might be. I mean, the, the, uh, the hurricanes and fires and everything that happened in the US last year, which are unbelievable cost that associated with all of these. And they're all associated with global warming. The, 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 the magnitude of the hurricanes was because you have an increased rate of warming of, of the surface water in, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico, which is associated with global warming. And then the, 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 the brush fires are, were, were also associated with, with the extreme heat warming and a change of, of 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 um, uh, of precipitation, so um, you can everybody says says well look this this is a product of global warming, it cost n billion dollars, but so Trump can't really deny that that well he can actually but he <laughs> <laughs> can do but, anything <laughs> but, but at a certain point if this carries on and it will I mean the the the, the thing is this. This season, this, this hurricane season uh, coming up will probably be worse than last year. I mean, it's not so much, it used to be the case that you'd have a sporadic hurricane seasons, good and bad, and, and it was random. But what we're now seeing is that you had a terrible one, and the next one will be even more terrible. And everything else is like that anyway. It's not any more that we're dealing with sort of random extremes uh but the extremes are are persistent and and as they get persistent we we st will start to see i'm just thinking about the us but we should be thinking about the world but think about the us uh and and you have another hurricane season that's even worse than this the last year then you have to start abandoning cities and abandoning uh, very large areas of the southern 
United States because if they're destroyed by a hurricane and then they, before you rebuild them, they're destroyed again the next year and then the year after that, there comes a point where the, there's parts of the world that, that can't be lived in anymore. And surely one would hope that would that the people, or politicians that is, uh, would appreciate that 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 means that global warming is is absolutely having a, a an enormously destructive effect on the planet. Yeah, I, I could. I, I had this vision before I got so rudely interrupted by Jennifer Hines. I, I had this. I had this vision of um, you know Arctic geoengineering going on while the oil rigs um, underneath are pumping out all the oil and the. Tankers are going, you know, uh, tankers are, are, are going through the passage and everything. There's no ice, but there's geoengineering going on, which is maybe, you know, this is kind of tr the, the Trump vision, possibly. Yes, I mean, the it's vision is like, uh, you know, having, having your lung removed while you continue smoking, that sort of thing. It's, it's, <laughs> it's horrible, <laughs> horrible, horrible. Could, I, I really want to dive into the Arctic because it's been such an interesting yeah. year up in the Arctic this year. Let me, let me, let me just go into here because we've had the polar vortex splitting in half once again. I think this is like the fifth year in a row this has happened, you know, where you've had the polar air mass half going to the US, half going, you know, Canada and the US and half going to mm. Siberia, where, whereby the Arctic is is way above freezing and you know Jennifer Francis has been doing a lot of work lately on the jet streams and also mm. more recently the impact of the storms in the North Atlantic you know like in the East Coast of the United States and the relationship um, you know this this happening on with the jet stream and the splitting of the polar vortex so you know given this i think that we can safely say that the hurricane seasons are going to get a lot more extreme and i'm wondering exactly what you see from like a hurricane perspective especially um in an ice-free arctic and what is the jet stream going to look like in an ice-free arctic it's already like very disorganized so i'm wondering what do you see in that case can you talk about that please well i mean it this 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 year seemed to be very crazy because the um um we had this extreme cold in europe which um is is a typical uh, extreme weather event um but at the same time, the, 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 the warming of the Arctic that went with it was, was far greater than any previous um, event like that. I mean, it, it was giving you um, temperatures at the, the North Pole that were above zero in, in January, February, which is uh, just unheard of. So 20 to 30 degrees of, of warming in the, in, the, in the Arctic, which means, of course, if, you, if that's going to keep happening, then that, that will just finish off the sea ice very very rapidly not only finish off the sea ice but but cause a, an increase in the very fast increase in the rate of melting of the greenland ice sheet that increases sea level rise so that all the effects that we've been seeing that that are accelerating and that i've been sort of warning about in in my book suddenly with these weather events if they if that's going to carry on in the way that they've started they all get an extra boost so that, that it's, it's not just a farewell to ice, it's a farewell to ice plus um, a, a kind of weather event, a weather event disaster, uh, which, which will be huge amounts of warming of, of or disruption of food production at low, low latitudes, but um, massive amounts of warming at high latitudes, which gives you the... Uh, uh, um, big increase in in the the primary driving which is loss of ice and everything that goes with it so um it, it all looks very bad and and the, in a sense the weather events which which seem to be just another thing that might or might not be be derived from from arctic warming that i think they're moving to center stage as something that is derived from arctic warming and it's going to get worse and will have a, a lot of extra impact on all the nasty things that are going on. Um, yeah, so, so, so do you think then that, that, that there the will be geoengineering of the Arctic? Well, I, I think there has to be. And um, the, I mean, 
as far as I can see, the, the, the methods that, that I've been interested in and working with the people on, on which is the uh, marine cloud brightening, that could be applied virtually immediately if you spend enough money and, and to, to put out, to, to put in enough of the uh, enough ships or enough enough of these these um, masts carrying the uh, the the the, the, the seawater vapor up into the up into cloud if you you according to our models anyway if you if you put those in the right places you can actually have some effect in bringing back the sea ice of cooling the arctic and who would, who would make this decision yeah, assuming assuming we do it, it would, would this have this this would would it have to be a world decision, or could an individual country just go out and do this? Well, uh, I think an individual country could do it. I mean, the cost, the total cost, is is something which probably should be borne on a global scale. But you could do if if you just if you wanted to sort of uh, be a benevolent country saving the world, then according to the people who are developing marine cloud brightening about 70 million pounds which is nothing you could actually get this implemented and so that's the level of to, to start getting marine cloud brightening working and it it's not a lot but it's a lot in relation to research budgets but it's nothing compared to the the sort of budgets that politicians throw around like, like building ludicrous uh, French power sta nuclear power stations is nothing and and yet they're not willing to do it and and uh, I've been talked through via my colleagues with with uh, 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 with government science advisors and they can't get anything through the British government at all they're not you know that you're dealing with a government which claims to be the greenest government ever then of course in an aside the same person said let's get rid of all this green crap um, so you've you've got a government which supposedly is committed to 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 try and doing something on a global scale about about um, uh, warming and yet here's one di one area where they could make a difference and which has been developed by british scientists where you could and you, you could try it out put some money into it and make a real difference to to global climate and and especially target this restoration of sea ice and they're just simply not interested it's sir david king who is the one who's was been pushing here he said it's completely hopeless that he's got there's no way that the british government will support anything that costs significant amounts of money on climate change they're completely yeah, but there are there are um you know, there, there are many there, there are many dissenting voices when it comes to um, geoengineering um, and geoengineering the Arctic because it, it worries just as a, like it's technology upon technology upon technology. Um, and what, if any, side effects do you see um, which could be negative of geoengineering here? Um, well, I, I, I don't see a lot of side effects on the marine cloud brightening because um, the, the side effects I think that are worst would be from um, shooting a load of um, sulfate aerosols up into the stratosphere because if you do that you've, you're, you're, um, you're covering that it spreads out throughout the entire stratosphere and takes months to, to come, fall out so if, if what you're doing to the, the entire Earth's upper atmosphere is, has some harmful effects somewhere like um, may be affecting the monsoon and which you didn't foresee but it's happening you have to wait a few months while it screws up the earth until it all falls out and, and then you, you you think again but with marine cloud brightening you, you have a lot of individual um uh, you can use ships or you can use land stations a lot of individual ships um in inserting this um, um uh, water vapor into the cloud and um, if it if it doesn't work or if it does something wrong or some something nasty happens, you just immediately stop, and that's it. You, you've, you're not doing you're not doing any harm. Um, first of all, you're not doing any harm anyway because the uh, the material you're using is not poisonous. Uh, whereas there'll be a lot of probably public fear that that sulfate aerosols are, go, are yet another poison in the atmosphere. 
Um, but uh, marine cloud brightening is, is not poisonous. And um, if it does any harm, you, you just stop doing it and immediately the harm stops. You're not, you're not have stuck with things that are floating around in the stratosphere. Yeah, or immediately the, the harm um, starts to increase again because of the albedo effect. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any marine cloud brightening um, stations or ships currently in the Arctic going right now? No, nothing at all. No, I mean, there's been lots and lots of research done on it. And in fact, a very, very, um, a very, very good um, uh, plan and a blueprint for the, the, the vehicles that could deploy this has been produced by this professor in, in Edinburgh, Stephen Salter. So it's really is, has gone a long way. It's gone as far as you can go without doing anything, without, without put anybody putting in enough money to practice. To, to 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 try and put it into practice. All right. So you think so, maybe somebody, if somebody like Bill Gates led farewell to ICE and had a chat with you, then you could maybe get it sorted. Well, yes. I mean, I think it, it's it's of a level that could be funded by a, a philanthropist. I mean, it's uh, you should get somewhere that way. You you could you could get pilot programs done, see if it works. Um, because if we're waiting for governments to do it. Well, you know, we wait in vain. You know, one thing about ice is you kind of need ice to stick other ice to it, right? So, like, mm -hmm. after your ice goes away, to establish that thin skin, it takes a lot more energy, doesn't it? And then once that little thin skin is there, you can kind of put stuff on, on it. So, given that and the degradation that we're seeing in the Arctic Ocean right now, mm -hmm. how long do we have to implement this, for instance, marine cloud brightening scheme? Well, um, it, it, the, the loss of ice is, is going ahead very fast. And the, um, at the moment, we could, we'll probably be seeing the ice a, a summer ice free arctic in, in 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 just a few years time and then that summer ice free area extent will extend in 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 duration so instead of one month it'll be two three four months so we're going to to really have a an a seasonal arctic a bit like the the antarctic uh, where we we're basically ice free during the the whole time when there's a lot of solar radiation at the summer months and that the ice will kind of grow back to some uh, extent in the winter but but there's going to be a much lo a longer period uh, without any ice um and as you say you know it's once the ice if there's if there's any ice present and this has always been the case in the past if there's any ice present in summer however thin it is then it it, it has a, this um uh, it, air conditioning effect on the planet. It it, it keeps the uh, keeps the water cold. It stops the water from warming up and melting the seabed. It keeps the air cold, or it keeps the the air from from getting warm, warmer than zero degrees. So it's it's doing it's doing a wonderful job, as long as it's there. But when you you put in enough um, latent heat to get rid of it, and it's not there then suddenly there's, 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 there's nothing to stop fairly extreme things from happening. There's nothing to stop the seawater from warming up and melting the seabed and giving you methane eruptions. And there's nothing to stop the atmosphere from warming up way above zero in the summer and, and then uh, wafting around over to Greenland and, and melting Greenland ice cap. So you, once the ice has gone, it, there's a big step change. When, when the ice has gone really catastrophic things can happen when while the ice is there it's a regulator on climate so uh, uh, at what point then just to maybe follow on from jennifer's um, question at, uh, at, what, at what point um in time do you see um geoengineering of the arctic or marine cloud branding of the arctic as you suggest at what point in time do you see it's, it's kind of too late to do that um well, I suppose you could say it's never too late, but I mean, the, 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 the modelling we've done is, assumes that, that the, there's still ice present in the Arctic Ocean uh, and the, the addition of the cloud brightening inputs simply makes the ice limits expand. 
and they expand, we hope, to the point where they, they cover the, the coastal waters and, and uh, slow down the, the loss of, of, um, uh, of, of methane. Um, so you have, to, you have to build on what's already there. If, if the ice has gone completely, then um, it's an extra step to, to, cool, to cool the water down to the point where it will start to freeze again. It's, it, if, you're adding, if you're adding ice to an existing ice cover and just stretching the, the limits, that's one thing. But, but if the ice has gone, and that means the seawater has gone a few degrees above zero. Are we, are we, talking, are we talking about all year ice here? Yes, we're talking about all year ice. Um, we, we're trying to uh, expand the ice limits ev in every season of the year. You keep the thing running year round. And um, if, you're, if you've got ice present and you can expand the ice limits and, and get uh, an improvement in the, in the, in the surround, in, in the, ed the, the edge zone. But if, there's not, if the ice has gone, there's, there's not much you can do. Um, it's, that, that will result in a warming of the ocean to the point where um, cloud brightening won't, won't give, do, be much help to you. So you've said that you believe that we could have an ice-free Arctic in summer in a couple of years. Let's yes, stretch yes. it. Let's stretch it out. Let's say five years at the outset. I, would, I wouldn't say it would be more than five years in September that we'd have an ice-free Arctic. So hmm. given that what you've said, we would have approximately between now and say five years to establish this marine cloud brightening station network mm. so it's like you've got five years to do that or that scheme doesn't work at all is that right yes it, it is really we we have to start now we should be already building um marine cloud brightening systems testing them out and and then uh if we can see that they're working getting building a lot more i mean this is uh this is something that's that's urgent, and but in fact, uh, in, at least in Britain, it's not regarded with any urgency at all. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are concentrating a lot on the Arctic here, and excuse me um, for because I know you guys both love the Arctic, and, and you especially, Peter. I mean, it must be absolutely beautiful to be up there and your memories and stuff apart from that <laughs> one, that one time your submarine went on fire underneath the arctic which i always tell people about you know um uh, you know we, we we talk about you know we're talking about the earth's resources here overpopulation uh we're talking about ocean acidification we're talking about plastic in the oceans we're talking about potential financial collapses of the earth financial system we're talking about you know, uh, there, there are so many other factors as well um, which come into play here as far as uh, existence of uh, humanity um, on the planet um, is concerned. Um, and it, just to say, for, just, just pick one, the fa financial situation, because there seems to, we seem to be in a pretty bad financial situation at the moment and there you know there's we get a lot of forecasts um that we're, we're in for a big financial dip soon and you know if, if there is then you've got like three three days worth of food on the shelf and then it's all gone you know and we're also we're right i'm already seeing migrations of people say from venezuela um mm -hmm. to brazil um and all these other things as well um, are, are kind of going on. Um, and I don't see much in the way to stop them, whether we marine cloud brighten or not. I think this is just going to continue to go on uh, because all we have is the planet's resources. And we're just destroying the planet and using up all its resources. And this scares me as much as uh, climate change does. I mean, I'm not that to tell you the truth, you know, I'm worried about methane, but I think CO2 is enough to do, to do yeah. the damage. Mm. Um, so um, it's just a, you know, just to maybe get things into a little bit of perspective that there are so many other bad, there's so much other bad shit going on. Mm. Well, yes, yeah, so you're right. I mean, the, the, wherever you look, it's bad. And uh, one would hope to kind of pull out, it's like a great big tangle of wool where you're trying to pull 
one strand out that you can you can understand and deal with but yeah. you can't because the, the, everything is tied in together and and everything seems to be bad at the moment so uh uh yes i mean i i I've, if 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 you take the the kind of holistic view it's um, uh, holistically bad <laughs> and one wishes there was a there was a way you could see to cure things i mean uh, we we're, we're just thinking about the this trying to bring the sea ice back to to get rid of one one particular effect but um there's there's going to be no let up in in sea level rise um whatever we do and and that's going to be really destructive both of the uh, sit coastal cities and and destructive of of coastal communities like in bangladesh so you, you're going to have some massive costs and damage there you, you're going to have crop failures and um from the uh weather extremes at a time when the population is is increasing in a crazy way i mean the, the un predictions about um population by the end of the century they 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 they're quite bad for the most of the world but they're disasters for africa where they they forecast a quadrupling so how do you how do you feed a, a continent which can't feed itself now and has four times as many people in it by the end of the century i mean how do you avoid mass famine and and um that these these sort of things are coming up fast and um nobody's coming up with any solutions and nobody's really everybody's trying to avoid even thinking about these these uh, these changes and in in the hope that they, you know, if you close your eyes they might go away um so it is i i find it pretty dispiriting and <laughs> increasingly yeah. dispiriting actually mm. um could, could you talk about the impending sense of panic or the increasing sense of panic that you're seeing among your colleagues and other people who are understanding the situation and the severity of the situation is is there a sense of panic i mean i've watched your own evolution i assume other people are having this evolution of understanding as well and increasing severity is there a sense of panic in the scientific community uh, at this point uh, there is i think yes i mean if you now if you look at scientific papers now um about on climate say if you read um, papers in nature for instance it always used to be the case of sort of on the one hand on the other hand and so on and people would would write very very restrained articles mainly because they wanted to um, uh, didn't want to affect their career prospects so you you would it, it was it there wasn't a sense of 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 civ of panic or or of urgency among scientists but now there is i mean every every p article you see is 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 now looking at some aspect of global change recognizing that it's accelerating and then predicting what that will lead us to in that particular con uh, uh, context and and so it's uh, amongst just as it's getting to be much more urgent and amongst scientists but there's there's enormous resistance amongst politicians in actually doing anything uh, about about what the scientists are now feeling is more and more urgent yeah because scientists are obviously constrained <coughs> constrained by vested interests they're constrained about what they're allowed to say well yeah. one person i really admire is kevin anderson do you know him personally uh peter no, I don't know him personally, but I've seen his work. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, and and he doesn't. He, you know, he tells it as it is, um, and I'm surprised he's still got a job. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know. Well, maybe he's he's in. Maybe he's approaching retirement like me. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing which I was interested in, um, and and we've had questions on the group about. Um, well, it was about nuclear, which um, um, Jennifer mentioned earlier on, about mm. nuclear power stations, um, about climate change uh, affecting them, um, in terms of sea level rise affecting them, about the fact that we've got about 450 of these that are probably, a lot of them are probably um, 
breaking down anyway in terms of their infrastructure. Um, do you see, <clears throat> how do you see this, this nuclear issue and also nuclear war, um, Peter? Um, do you, you know, how, what's your take on the melting down of power stations and mm. the potential of nuclear war? Well, both of these are pretty awful. I think the, the nuclear power stations, um, well, when I've been, I was looking at this problem and, and you, the, the problem is using water-cooled reactors because you know, a water-cooled reactor, you have to have it by the sea. You have it by the sea and it gets done in by a tsunami or just by ordinary sea level rise. So Britain building new French nuclear reactors by the sea is madness and um you, but you can have nuclear reactors that that are not water cooled um these um um pebble bed reactors which which have a solid have use a solid material air cooled and don't have to be near water you can have and those those can be of different scales even as well you don't have to have giant ones and they can be a long way inland. Well, so, of, of, the, of the 400, I'm sorry to interject here, but of the 450 <coughs> that we've got, which are ordinary nuclear power stations at the moment, we may be able to have this technology, but for me, this top technology is just to keep economic growth going anyway, and it's new technology mm -hmm. to consume more and keep our lifestyles going. There's obviously a huge change in lifestyle, if there's, if there's any chance of there ever being a, any sort of change. Um, but these 450 nuclear power stations are already there and, and they're already, you know, if they all melt down, um, it will, are we extinct? Well, it's, it's <laughs> well, we, I don't think the, the melting of the power stations will make us extinct, but a nuclear war would. And, and right. that's, that's the other frightening thing is, is the, the, the belief that, that certainly America seems to have that a nuclear war is a conceivable thing. It used to be, we realized this will be, well, it's, you know, Einstein said, you know, the, the, he, he didn't know how the third world war would be fought, but the fourth world war would be fought with sticks and stones. In other words, we, we, a nuclear war will wipe us out. And, and that was accepted even by sort of right wing American presidents like, like, uh, um, Reagan, he had to actually, he said, you know, a, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And of course, that's obvious to 99% of the population, but it wasn't obvious to him. He had to suddenly have that thought and then express it. And, and then we thought, well, at least he realised that. But Trump doesn't, you know, he, and Trump surrounds himself by people who don't. And the, the, the military industrial complex in America is, is building massively spending huge amounts of money of our money on on systems that that supposedly are are going to be survivable and minor have minor impacts which of course they won't so they're, they're, it, it still is the end of the world and um the frightening uh, I, don't, I don't think Putin's much better either is he no no it, exactly that they're, they're the, the, but the the idea that it's conceivable that you could have a nuclear war um, as an instrument of policy, and and the frightening thing is, you know, Trump is, if he like, if he doesn't get his way with the North Koreans, he could easily just have a war, just just blast them with the nu nuclear weapons without a second thought of, of about the consequences. And the frightening thing is that somebody like that can be in charge of the world's most powerful nation. So the prospect of nuclear war is 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 much closer than it was um a few years ago and and uh, it's very very frightening because it, there isn't it, it's not survivable it's it, that will be the end of of, of everything mm, this is all very depressing and there's one more factor mm. that we haven't mentioned and that's oxygen i saw a lot of work lately mm. how oxygen is really going down in the biosphere after time and if you look at it it kind of is a mirror image of the carbon dioxide rise you know as carbon dioxide is rising also oxygen is going down every year exponentially as we cut down more trees and oxygen producers and the algae and 
plankton and everything like that that you know gives us a lot of oxygen so you know a, a nuclear war obviously you know when you set those things off you look at the pictures of them you realize it's just burning oxygen i mean those things just yeah. punch holes in the biosphere which is horrible so i mean it, it, it is very depressing because i mean you know on one hand we've got this and that and this and that and then you look at the oxygen chart and then you see it it's going down every single year every single year every single year and so it's just like it just seems just so inevitable the whole thing you know the crushing extinction of our species i think we're going to just yeah. go down. I mean, that's the only thing I can see. I, I hope to God that we can sequester carbon and do all that. But even if we do that, we've still got exponential population. We've got acidifying seas. We've got plastic in the ocean. We've got all these things going on. It's just like we live in a completely horrible time from a from a you know uh, pers that perspective. You know, I mean, what are we left with? How, what keeps you going? I mean, the light of studying all this all the time. Well, I suppose it gets worse as time goes on. But, uh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> um, it's certainly the, the case that I guess, well, I suppose based in a way based on limits to growth, that, that we're, we're now exceeded the carrying capacity of the planet and without the population and the, the level of, of industrialization um, and, and fossil fuel use, we, we, can't, we can't actually produce we we can't survive as we are on the planet and and um all of these bad effects are, are consequences of our own excessive exist <laughs> the excessive numbers and excessive um finger uh, footprint on the planet because we all demand that we uh, that we we have cars and and we all have the equivalent of 200 servants i think it's is what uh, Every every human being now has, um, because of all because of all the uh, industrialization and and uh, and uh, aids to our life. So we can't have a population of kind of eight nine billion, each with two hundred servants, making it sort of <laughs> eighteen hundred billion, and and survive on this planet. Uh, so something's got to give and. Uh, it's really, I, I don't see a way out. Um, I'm, I'm keen on this air capture, but that will only take, that would take care of the carbon dioxide problem. But uh, people who look at the whole view are, are pretty pessimistic. In fact, I, I, would, I'm I would recommend you read a very nice book, which, uh, <laughs> which, you can, which is called, and I should say it here, it's not by me. <laughs> experimenting on a small planet oh. it's, it's a guy called um william hay in in boulder colorado it's very very thick but it's everything it's a the compendium of everything about what's happening to the planet and what if anything we can do about it and the more you read and he he's really put it, digging out all the facts and, and telling us and and in the end he says well that there was, there was going to have to be a, a giant epidemic or something like that will happen because we can't carry on the way yeah. <laughs> we didn't even mention that did we <laughs> you know viruses and diseases mm. and you know that's that's just an added extra to add on you know mm. it's uh it's a <laughs> you know this is it's pretty depressing isn't it anybody got a joke to tell <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll tell a joke. I'll tell a joke, okay? Knock, knock. Who's there? Um, nobody. <laughs> no, I, 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 I told it wrong. I'll do it again. Knock, knock. Who's there? Knock, knock. Nobody. Nobody who? <laughs> the <laughs> silence of extinction, right? Is that it, Mike? Knock, knock, who's there? God, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at telling jokes. But knock, knock, <laughs> who's there? Nobody. And I told it to a couple of little lads where I live in Scotland, and they loved it. They were laughing their heads off because they said, nobody here, and I just stood there silently. Because <laughs> there's nobody there. I mean, there's got to be nobody here either on the planet. Mm. Um, but I don't know how long we've been on. Uh, we seem to me, to have been on quite a while, have we, Jen? 
Yeah, I think we have been on quite a while, but that's all right. It's going to be our feature interview, so. Oh, okay. Well, I, I have to... <laughs> I have to do a few things because I'm, I'm flying off to uh, Italy early in the morning. You're right. Flying off to Italy, right, that's yeah. fine. And I, I desperately need the toilet. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and um, finish up this interview. So, yeah. Professor Peter Wadhams, it's been an absolute pleasure in a strange sort of way um, yes, to interview yes. you and speak with you again and, and lovely to see you and good luck with all your work with carbon sequestration. We, we fully support everything you're doing. Wish you the best. Thank you very much and uh, sorry that the, the discussion seemed to go in an entirely negative direction. Know, no, it I tends to happen. <laughs> That's the way well, it is, unfortunately. You know, I mean, my joke didn't work, you know, so. <laughs> We've all lost our sense of humor, so. But anyway, it is Extinction Radio after all. We have to delve into yeah. these matters, but. but thanks, um, thanks a lot, Peter. Okay. Really, really appreciate us get, getting this together. And in a month or a couple of months or so, we'll do it again and we'll see. Uh, your further evolution. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hope you don't take me as an example of the <laughs> evolution towards total despair. Of the, yeah, the example. Oh, yeah. It's, it's too horrible to be born, really. But in any case, it's lovely to see you again, and we hope to see you again soon. So thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. It's appreciated because we know how, how valuable your time is and how sought after you are um, for interviews and stuff. So. Thanks, thanks. Right. Okay, it's a pleasure. Right. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers.